I was first introduced to this fish in the late 1990s when they were known but rarely seen. When found at a convention, they were a big deal, and many had impressed upon me that this was a fish that I had to own and had to build up their numbers. Considered essentially extinct in the wild since the early 1970s, they're undergoing their fifth attempt at reintroduction of the wild right now, with no conclusions yet on the success of this most recent attempt. At least four previous efforts, to my understanding, have not been successful. I finally found this fish, bought at an ALA convention in 2001. I got him home, but they weren't healthy. They were fish that had not been maintained in the same water conditions for more than one or two generations for many years, and as a result, were weak to begin with, and they didn't do well. Then I obtained a fish after another couple of attempts. I finally obtained fish from John Mangan, who had been maintaining the same line for many generations. That same line is in roughly its 14th year here, and is one of the hardiest and healthiest gradients in this fish room. The thing about them is that when you can go to a show or a convention and buy a pair of uh, tequilas or two pair of tequilas and have them be at the upper limits of what they will grow out to be, such as that female that's right there in front, well, those two of them actually, and take them home and stare at them for two to three years uh, until they live their lives out and they'll never drop a fry for you. And the reason is because these guys breed uh, not only best, but pretty much only when they're first sexing out. So when females are young and they're first, you know, uh, about six to eight months old or so is when they're the most uh, prolific and when they breed the best. Uh, and the males are the most uh, interested in breeding as well. Customers will often write and they'll say, you know, I understand you deal in rare fish and things that are disappearing from the hobby. Um, what do you recommend? And uh, I, this is the fish I almost always recommend. Um, they're really hardy. Uh, they breed well. Uh, they, uh, they're peaceful. They don't bother anybody. Um, I strongly recommend that you keep them in species-only tanks uh, because they are so rare and there aren't that many of them around. But uh, they're a great fish for conservation. And then when you do get a bunch of them, you can write me. I can possibly talk about ways to distribute any young to local aquarium clubs or whatever. If I'm running low or I need some, I'll, I often will buy some buy fish back from people. Um, but with these guys, uh, if you want to if you want to help uh, keep something around that's probably going to be real hard to find, if not entirely gone from the hobby within 10 years or so, uh, this would be a good fish to uh, to go ahead and keep. And for some reason, they're all running away from me here with the camera, so the males are way in the back. I know there's at least six or eight males in there, but it's a very cool little fish. So when I ship sex pairs, they'll be young, just sexing out fish. The fish you receive will be healthy and hardy and should breed well for you with temperatures under 75 degrees, good water quality, aeration, and some good food. They don't require live food, but they certainly do better when it's a frequent part of their diet. The Zoogeneticus tequila is not difficult to keep, but it does have a few basic requirements. The tequilas are a well-behaved, peaceful gadeid that requires temperatures below 74 to 75 degrees and is comfortable down to about 68 to 70, 70 degrees. Here they're kept at 74. My water is at 7.4 pH and they have adapted to 90 ppm which is softer than they would normally prefer so I don't add crushed oyster shell or crushed coil to bring up the hardness. The fish that come out of here are already adapted to that little bit softer water but I'm sure they'd have no problems adapting to water that was more hard. The tequilas are kept in tanks with minimal substrate, live plants, healthy aeration, some water movement, and filtration that removes organic material from the aquarium. I use box filters here that are changed monthly or hang on the back filters where the floss is changed regularly. Moderate lighting is best as they'll pick at algae and may pick on some softer plants. Customers have told me they've had tequilas eat duckweed but I have not seen that here. 
Here their dry food, dry food diet has a strong vegetable component. They'll produce five to ten young after a 60 day gestation and they often do not do well in net breeders where the females may not survive or the fry may be dropped prematurely. <clears throat> but they are a good deer that will occasionally eat their fry. So when a female is gravid, she does best when you take her and put her into a five or a ten gallon tank by herself, moderately planted, with fine leaf plants such as java moss or fern, then remove the female as soon as you see young and raise the young up separately. They are primarily bred here by filling up 10 gallon tanks with fry and I do this by putting females into a lightly planted tank to drop their fry and then they are removed and the fry are raised up for about two weeks. At that point the fry are too small to be interested in bothering new fry but they are too large to be eaten by the adults. Other gravid females can then be added to the tank to drop their fry, and this way few fry are ever eaten. The old fry act as dither fish for the fish being born and allow the new fry to escape from being picked on. This fish is very rare in the hobby and it's one of the prettier, least aggressive, and easiest to maintain good deal, and quite prolific that you can get in the hobby. They are extinct in the wild and can have been considered so for about 40 years. If you're able to maintain a tank at cooler temperatures below 75 degrees throughout the year and want to keep a truly rare fish, this may be the fish for you. This is a shot of one of those tens. I've got, uh, you know, these plants are full of fry. As you can see, there's a few females in here. I'll usually let it, I'll often let a female stay in here for a week or so after she's dropped her fry to get healthy again before putting her back in with the other fish. Sometimes after a fish is dropped, she's somewhat weakened physically and you put her in the tank and the males chase her around and you end up with problems and again with this fish being as as rare as it is, I don't want to lose females simply because I wasn't taking care of them. So anyway, this is one of those tens and there's, I don't know, there's probably about 50 fry in here and I, may, I might have three or four females in here. But this is the best way to go ahead and breed them out. So Michael writes, um, and Michael and I are, are, are good friends, we email back and forth quite often, he's bought from me often, uh, but I found this earlier email from him and it really kind of sums up something I hear often from customers. So if I understand you right, you're saying $55 for the shipping and another $30 for four fish. And this was an older email, back when prices were a little lower. That makes them, for me, $85 uh, for four fish or over $20 each. I went through this not too long ago and I was trying to get some fish from a fellow in, in Minnesota. The price of the fish was fantastic and the gray was, guy was great and the fish appeared to be stupendous, but the price to ship to me was exorbitant and prohibitive. Okay, first off, I'm a hobbyist, hobbyist as well and I ordered online just like everybody else did for many years. And I'm right with you on the postage thing and, and uh, today I'm in a position now where I give quotes on postage and when I first started this. A priority uh, shipment was $15 and an overnight uh, shipment was $35 and that would allow for two pair um, would take a little more water or six younger fish. Um, today um, I don't ship priority anymore because of changes in PayPal policy which I go into more further in an upcoming video on shipping but the uh, the what was $35 back then which was when I started eight years ago is now $55. So pretty much if you want to order, you know, six fish, it's going to cost $55. Now, well, customers have written me early on and they said, you know, I don't know about that cost. That seems a little bit high, la da da Well, that's, uh, and, and they, they were convinced that with some people they were uh, making money on the postage. So I made a point when I first started this to be as transparent as possible. So when you get your box, it says on the box how much your postage cost. And if I have overestimated your postage by more than $6, I send you back the entire difference. So, for instance, if I overestimate your shipping uh, by $8 and I send you back a check for $8.
So, um, uh, and, and I use only USPS overnight, and that's actually by far the cheapest way to go. Um, I had a customer a while back, there was an overnight box, it was $38 at that time. I took it to UPS to see what they wanted me to, uh, wanted to ship the same box, because uh, the customer wanted to go UPS, they didn't want to go USPS, the Postal Service. So I checked with them, and the Postal Service wanted $38, and UPS wanted 108 So that seemed to me like it was a little bit... You know, a little bit out, a little bit out there. So, a little while later, I had a similar situation come up. So I did the same thing again, and I took a box uh, to uh, the uh, a UPS office first this time, and I got quoted two hundred and sixty dollars. I thought, oh my god, because it was a bigger box uh, that was for shipping overnight. So then I went to USPS, the postal service, and they wanted eighty-five dollars to ship the same box overnight. So then I realized that you know UPS. Maybe it's just from here, I don't know, but it runs two to three times as much as USPS does. And FedEx won't ship live fish from this area, so I can't use FedEx. So the prices I'm quoting you is just what the post office charges me. I mean, I don't set postal rates. And trust me, you know, I, I keep a lot of this in my head. When the post office ups their rates, I lose money for a while because, until I learn what the new rates are, because that's just the only way to do it. So, uh, you know, I'm not for it either, but that's just what it costs to ship something to you. Uh, to you. And I must say that we have tracking information now that's you know a lot more consistent than it was eight years ago. Um, and the number of times that I have problems with boxes getting somewhere are really, really uh, small compared to what it used to be, uh, particularly with priority where uh, I lost fish often. So anyway, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Um, I don't get a penny of anything that you, that you pay for me for shipping. It all goes to the Postal Service, but um, I'm happy with what they've done and, and I happen to have a really good post office. So um, I know it's not that way for everybody. <laughs> But, um, but uh, that's how it is, and that's why shipping costs what it does. So I hope that answers. Okay, the next question is from Andy. He writes, Hi, Mr. Sage. My name is Andy, and I am 15 years old. Um, I have read through many of your articles at the website, but I could not find an answer to my question. Can you overfilter an aquarium? Man, Andy, what a great question. Um, <clears throat> the brief answer when you're talking about the filters that are available to us in the aquarium hobby for the tanks that you keep at home is basically no you can you can uh, as long as the fish are comfortable in the water in other words you don't want to have filtration going at such a a rate that the fish are fighting current the whole time because the water is constantly going through the filter so it's a balance between what's comfortable for the fish and um uh, and, the, and the and the quality of the filtration that you're receiving but the issue comes down to uh, when you go to my website or, or books or anywhere else and you read in the, in the, in the things about how to keep the fish, um, I often say, you know, this fish requires a relatively clean aquarium with a minimal substrate. So clean, what is clean, you know? And, and so the thing about the, the issue of clean is that, um, for example, I have two things of water here. One of them is clean. I got it from the bathroom around the corner. The other one was taken off the top of an aquarium from downstairs. One of them, the fish will live pretty good in. They'll do, they'll do well in that water. The other one, the fish won't do so well in it. They're both really well filtered. So uh, what is the issue? Well, if you have a hard time you know, picturing what the difference is between the two waters, um, take a drink. You know, you know, which one is it going to be? Which one is the one that's going to be clean and which one's going to come from your aquarium? And will you drink the one from your aquarium? One is well filtered, one is clean. So to answer this question further, uh, we need to go downstairs because it's important that you keep your water with a biological load, an organic load in the water stream that is common in a well filtered tank, but is not present in the clean water that comes right out of your tap. And there are some fish here that require that that organic load, that bacterial load in the water, be maintained at a certain level or they do not survive well. Some fish will do well in water that's a certain way, others will not. Um, downstairs, I actually had to make changes in my fish room because of one of the species I keep. And I'll go ahead and I'll discuss that and we'll go off to the fish room. So, I'll see you in a moment. People often refer to keeping fish in a bare bottom aquarium, thinking that this is the cleanest and the best way to keep fish that are particularly fragile or sensitive, or where they want to really be sure to keep a close eye on the fish so that, in theory, the fish will do well. 
When I first started to breed many of these fish in some organized fashion, when they were moved around a lot as they aged, they were generally fed very heavily and they were stocked in heavier numbers, I thought that going bare bottom would be the best for the fish and would give me, as the fish keeper, the greatest control over the water quality. I'd also been told that any filter medium and the sides of the tank were more than adequate for nitrifying bacteria. But as I soon found out, and with a few species in particular, um, I was very wrong. Um, though many of the species here did uh, do fairly well, I had one species in particular, the Lumia nigra fasciata, that just would not do well uh, in my tanks. At the time, I was also working at the lab at Colorado University where they were kept in good numbers, and there they did well. So I was constantly beating myself up over what, what we were doing at CU that I wasn't giving them here. And at the school, they were maintained with a thick layer of gravel substrate that students thoroughly siphoned once a month. With the exception of a few floating plants and a sponge filter, there were no other decors in the aquarium. There was nothing else in the tanks. The only water changes they received was when the gravel was siphoned and they were fed a, a, a dry food once a day. Here they were getting 15% daily water changes, three times per day daily feedings, and box filters uh, that removed any mold or organic waste from the aquarium in clean bare bottom tanks. Around that time, I was fortunate enough to visit the Zephyrus Stock Center in Texas, and they did not use filtration at all, only water changes in over 400 tanks, and they kept all the tanks bare bottom, but with one exception. Every tank had a single layer of gravel over one-third to one-half of the tank bottom, and in fact, directions were posted throughout the room to the workers that this was how the tanks were all to be maintained. That amount of gravel, as it turns out, is perfect to provide an adequate amount of nitrifying bacteria to keep your water quality at its best. But any more gravel will collect debris and organic waste and cause your water quality to deteriorate. So I came home and I did this with a couple of tanks to find that water quality dramatically improved, generally within three to four days. Tanks that would get routinely cloudy no longer did so. The bottom of the tanks were easy to keep free of debris, but more importantly, all of the fish, including the Niagara Fasciata, showed dramatic improvement and started to do really well. So today, all of the tanks are done that way here, and uh, it's worked out really well, and for these fish, uh, keeping them this way is almost essential. Thank you for watching this video on the Zoogeneticus tequila, and the next video coming out is gonna be one that uh, I've been putting together for a while, and it's on it, how I do all my shipping, where I get my boxes, how I put the boxes together, when you receive something, what it's going to look like, what to expect, um, and also some shipping stories, for instance, why I no longer ship priority. Um, so anyway, I look forward to seeing you in two weeks, and uh, uh, we'll see you then. Bye-bye. So if you've got a question you'd like to have answered that maybe we could answer here, um, please go ahead and email me. Um, the stranger the better, something about your tank, maybe you're trying to breed something like to hear from you. So um, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much.